So we're going to take a journey. Uh, the journey spans about 15 years of time. Uh, it's going to take us to multiple continents of uh, the world, and uh, as well as hopefully scale a therapy using cells to what we hope to see to be the next global cell therapy uh, that, that really gets distributed. So this medicine is something that has, uh, we've been working on for about 15 years, and uh, it involves cell communication. And, and so some of the points that I want to get across are how cells communicate, why cell communication is really important in health, what happens in disease to all of our cells and their communication patterns, and how we're going to try to fix it using a cell therapy. So with that, let's begin. And let me start by the first revelation that I had a long time ago, which is that cells communicate using cell phones. Right? Obviously. You know, this, is, this should be nothing new to everyone. Uh, it's, uh, it's why we call them cell phones. Uh, no, but uh, in all reality, cells communicate using natural molecules, okay? Proteins, fats, sugars, even genetic material, things like RNA and DNA, are made inside of cells, they're packaged up, and they're secreted outside of those cells through their cellular membranes. And if you have a not-so-great cell phone plan, those molecules only can act and diffuse locally. And we're talking about length, length scales of about 10 to 100 microns in size. That's the size and width of a human hair. And unfortunately, I don't have a prop to show you <laughs> that, that length uh, today, but uh, hopefully you get the point. So this type of local signaling, it's really nearest neighbor signaling that's taking place inside of tissues, very small environments. And we call this local signaling paracrine signaling, just to define some terms. Now, if you have uh, a even better cell phone plan, you will have the opportunity to do long range signaling, distance signaling. Uh, and we call this endocrine signaling. Uh, this is a way where a cell from one location in the body can secrete something and have it travel all the way to a distant part of the body. The classical examples are things like hormones, which are often made in the pituitary gland. They travel all throughout the bloodstream and cause physiological signals in other tissues. So great, we've defined short-term signaling, long-distance long signaling. Now, as engineers, which is really my background, where I'm trained, uh, what I'm trained in, we like to think of really the collection of cells, really an accounting problem. How can we accumulate all of these cell signals and understand this as a system? And so the aspect of systems biology comes in. So let's accumulate all of these cells from all of these tissues, secreting all of these things, traveling all around the human body. And that's the type of systems problem that engineers love to study, biomedical engineers love to study. And so for a man who really likes silence, this is a very noisy system. And Mother Nature has de designed it that way, uh, so that when there's an actual signal, when there's something that's really important that the body needs to respond to, it, go it breaks through that noise and the system changes. So one of those signals, unfortunately, can be disease. And what happens in really severe cases of disease? Significant injuries. Uh, we're talking about car accidents, gunshot wounds, drug toxicities, things where a life is lost and you never get to say goodbye. Well, the entire communication network breaks down. Uh, and there's a lot of dysfunction taking place uh, at, at multiple organ levels and as well as physiologically. And so our mission from a medicinal standpoint is to try to correct this dysfunctional communication pattern. That's our goal. How are we going to do it? in such a complicated systems network? Well, we decided to fight fire with fire. And we're using a cell therapy. So introduce the protagonist of the story. Uh, these are called bone marrow stromal cells. And uh, we'll use the acronym MSCs uh, just for brevity. These bone marrow stromal cells are found in the bone marrow of all of us. They exist there at very, very few numbers but in fact have, are, are starting to be developed as a cell therapy. And they have great attributes, actually, 
that make them uh, have the potential to be a medicinal product. Let me give you some examples. So these cells, you can isolate them. You can get them from bone marrow. You can actually plate them in a petri culture dish, and you can expand them tremendously to huge numbers. So if I need to make a medicine, I need to make a lot of it. And so from a single bone marrow donation, you can make thousands and thousands and thousands of products of hundreds of millions of cells per product. So the ability for these cells to grow makes them highly attractive as a cell therapy. Uh, apart from that, you're able to freeze these cells. So you can freeze them and ultimately create an inventory to distribute to hospitals locally as well as around the world. Uh, so these are great properties that enable these cells to actually be a, a potential cell therapy. But it's the utility that's important. So when I first started research, these cells were being applied as an intravenous medication to treat inflammatory diseases. Uh, they were showing very promising signs in small animal studies, but then they started to be applied to humans in clinical trials, and people observed a number of failures. And so I just started my research. I was excited by all the promising results that were out there, but I was faced with this paradox. How is this working in small animals, but not in human beings? And it led me to focus on the mechanism of action. And what I'm here to get across is that the mechanism of action of these cells is really a form of cellular communication. So here's really the paradox that I was faced with. When these cells, the convention was to intravenously administer these cells with the thought, the prevailing hypothesis was that these cells would find their target organ that's damaged, locally engraft in that organ, and sort of correct the inflammation and really the tissue damage that had occurred from a significant injury. But, you know, it, this just, just didn't make sense to me. Uh, the numbers really didn't work out. When these cells were being infused intravenously, 99% of them were, were disappearing. They were vanished, they were ultimately getting destroyed in the blood circulation. And so very few cells actually made it to a target organ. And to me, it seemed insufficient to change really the physiology of that organ, let alone the entire human body. And so I thought about the fundamental assumption, do these cells actually need to be in the human body at all? And we conducted some proof of concept experiments where we took these cells cultured in a dish and collected the molecules that these cells produced and injected molecules instead into an animal undergoing severe inflammation. And lo and behold, we reproduced the same therapeutic benefits without the cells ever actually being engrafted at all. And so we proved this concept that the mechanism of action of this cell was not necessarily paracrine cell communication, it was more endocrine. When these cells were being administered intravenously, they were giving a short burst of molecules, and it's really these molecules that were causing the physiological changes that we're seeing improve. That was the therapeutic hypothesis, the hypothesis that really set me uh, in a very different direction about how to develop this cell therapy. So when we solved uh, one problem, just like any uh, good problem that's solved, another three emerge. So the question was really about if these cells are secreting things and trying to communicate to the body to really correct and bring back balance, how do we scale something like this? This is a very different type of mechanism. It's not just a small molecule that you can orally administer. There's only a few routes of administration to get cells into the human body. And we knew that intravenous administration wasn't gonna get us there. And so we were, we were stuck uh, in terms of how to get this therapy engaged and interacting with the human body, and particularly the human bloodstream, at the scales that we needed to. And so when we looked around at all the different routes of administration, none really met our criteria. And so we had to think outside of the box. In fact, we actually ended up thinking outside of the body. So this is the technology that we developed. It's an extracorporeal cell therapy. And what we fundamentally did was we flipped the problem around. Instead of bringing cells to the bloodstream, we're bringing blood to these cells housed in a biomedical device. So what that means in terms of what a patient experiences is we've changed this from an intravenous drip infusion to a dialysis-like procedure. And this fundamentally makes all the difference in terms of uh, dosing. So as engineers, we love widgets. 
this is my widget. And uh, I'm going to show you what's inside of this widget that where, is all, where, where all the magic is, uh, is happening. But in order to really advance this science from a prototype stage that took place in academic labs, we had to build a company. We had to build a team around this. And that team is found in Lexington, Massachusetts, right here and now, working very hard uh, at actually learning how to manufacture this product, distribute it all around the country, and eventually uh, the world if uh, there's success at the end of the road. So Sentient is the name of that company, and it's really a, a tremendous team of hardworking individuals that are really moving this forward now. So let's look inside of this widget. What's happening? Well, blood is flowing through this device and then coming back to the patient in a, circula in a circulatory manner. And blood cells are traveling through all of these thousands of fibers that are within this device. These are hollow fibers. So the blood cells are traveling through them, and we put... MSCs on the other side of these fibers. So the MSCs are separated from blood by a membrane. And we effectively have given these cells, which were whispering by an intravenous administration route, we've now given them a bullhorn and a pedestal to, so that they can speak to the human bl bloodstream uh, in a really durable way. What's nice about this from an engineering standpoint is now we have full control of the number of cells that are interacting with the human blood, bloodstream, as well as the duration of therapy. Uh, we can turn this on and off at any point uh, as we like. And so it really puts the control back in physicians' hands to find ways to administer to the right disease at the right time. So as blood is flowing through, MSEs are secreting these molecules. And it's kind of like a blood car wash, if you think about it. We're, we're, we're trying to cleanse and recondition and reprogram blood cells as they continuously flow through uh, this device and these hollow fibers. This looks like a one-way conversation, but in fact, it's actually a two-way conversation. And this is where we leverage the advantage of cells in their ability to actually sense and react dynamically to their environment. So each one of us, when injured, will all react differently. There will all be ranges in different heterogeneity that are found in all of uh, individuals in terms of how they, they deal with conditions. And so in order to manage that heterogeneity, we're leveraging Mother Nature's sensing capabilities. These cells have the ability to actually respond in kind in a time scale that's relevant during this treatment to help uh, really sense the inflammatory environment of that subject and uh, secrete things in a tailored way to each individual. So this is what's inside the black box. We've been testing this black box for, for quite some time, and I want to show you some of the more uh, latest results. This is uh, through Sentient's hard work. Uh, we learned how to take a small prototype, manufacture it to a large one, and test it in large animals. And this is some of our uh, early um, efficacy data, where we took animals that were sick, we treated them continuously for 12 hours with a cellular device or an acellular device as a control, and we started to save some of these animals' lives. Uh, this gave us as a team, tremendous confidence to move forward into human trials. And I'm really excited to say that those trials have already begun. Uh, we are up and down the eastern seaboard uh, treating patients during our first phase 1B 2A human trial, looking at both the safety of this product as well as the efficacy in patients with kidney injury. Uh, these patients already get continuous uh, dialysis. The challenge is their outcomes are very poor. About 50% of them die. Uh, from this condition, and we're hoping to make improvements uh, uh, on their uh, outcomes uh, in this early study. And certainly, there's going to be plenty more uh, to follow, as well as expansion into other areas of injury uh, where this therapy could benefit. This is a large operation. It's taking place all around the country. And uh, a lot of individuals have come together to really see this idea through, and we're really excited um, to see the results next year when they come out. Myself, Sentian. These researchers are not the only ones who are playing around with cells. And I wanted to broaden the conversation to include an emerging class of medicine, uh, which are cellular medicines, that I think we'll see a lot more of in the next decade or two. Uh, the US uh, FDA has recognized cellular medicines as regenerative medicines and has actually sped up the process to review and approve uh, new regenerative medicine technologies um, uh, more recently in, in the past year. One thing to uh, bring to the attention is that this month came the first approval of a T-cell therapy that was engineered to actually attack and fight against 
one's own cancer cells. Uh, Novartis led this effort, and uh, they just won approval for the use of these engineered T cells for the treatment of leukemia, where they're seeing about 90% cures in a case where, with, if left untreated, there's about 10% uh, uh, folks who survive after five years. So at this point, I've talked to you about the what, I've talked to you about the how. Why did this start in the first place? Uh, and it's really the last form of cellular communication that I wanted to get across. And that's a form of self-communication. Uh, this is called autocrine signaling. This is where a cell secretes something and actually senses it itself. And I, I want to talk about this because this work started over 10 years ago at a moment where I was pretty torn about what I was going to do for my career. I was training in medicine and in engineering, uh, destined to go into my third year of medicine. Uh, and uh, right before that, I found myself in India. Uh, as part of an observership, I was uh, acting as a third year medical student, observing this, uh, the healthcare system in this country. And uh, during that period of time, I got to give research talks. And uh, at one place in particular, the Christian Medical College in south of India, gave a talk, and it really changed the way that I was thinking about my work. And so after presenting uh, my research, a doctor came to me and said, well, it's really exciting. You know, this prototype looks really cool. What are you doing with it? Are you going to bring it forward and advance it? And, you know, I said, no, I'm probably not. I'm going to go to medical school and, you know, finish my training. And, and uh, you know, I think I'll work on a new project at some point. And so he took me aside. He brought me to the neonatal intensive care unit of this hospital. And he showed me a baby boy that had just been born and lost his mom due to the pregnancy, due to liver disease, something that I was working on. And it was a time where he said to me, and it was a, it was a hard thing to hear, but that if I had been thinking more deeply about this and really trying to push myself to challenge myself to see how far I could take, maybe someday a kid like this wouldn't be an orphan. And I tell you what, that message burned a hole in my soul. And it's with me here today. It's in every single researcher that works uh, alongside of me. And I think it's the motivation and really the energy that we've been bringing to this uh, uh, work for so many years. So we've been trying to make science come alive uh, with these types of uh, innovations and these types of medical products. And there's actually other ways to bring science to life. And uh, we've been actually toying around with a new one, which is a science fiction graphic novel that's going to be coming out. It's going to talk about cells. It's going to talk about genetics. Uh, and hopefully, it's going to stimulate some uh, excitement among, among the next generation of our youth to uh, get involved in science and help come up with the, uh, the next innovations. So with that, in accumulation of all of my cells, I wanted to just say thank you very much. And it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank <laughs> you.